That's hello, dear friends, in my native language. My name is Galina Angarova, and I'm here to represent two worlds. I am an environmentalist. I've been an environmentalist since I was 18 years old, um, working for an organization called Pacific Environment, based here in San Francisco. For nearly two decades, we have partnered with local communities around the Pacific Rim, and specifically in Russia, China, Alaska, and California, to protect and preserve the ecological reaches of this vital ecological uh, and cultural region. I'm also here to represent my own people. We're called Buryats. We are native people who live on both shores of Lake Baikal, which is 20% uh, of world's fresh water. If you look at the map of the Asia-Pacific region, we see that most of it's ocean. When I think about it, I imagine the sacred womb of the planet that is a birthplace for vibrant cultures, history, Asian knowledge, and spirituality associated with the great ocean and nature. All the things that the modern world can learn from. Instead, the region is starting to be heavily exploited and treated as a, source of co as a resource colony in the most aggressive ways that does neither honor nor appreciate the people and, the, its, and their environment. All of a sudden, communities throughout the Asia-Pacific region find themselves in the midst of intensive developments such as oil and gas. For example, the region where I work from, or where I work, it's Sakhalin Island, just north of Japan, is the largest oil and gas project in the world, which heavily impacted most productive salmon spawning grounds and lands of local Nifhi people. Aggressive militarization, including construction of military bases and deployment of thousands of uh, <clears throat> soldiers into the region. Look at Jeju, what's happening in Jeju. Militarization of this beautiful World Heritage Site. Extensive mining in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and many, many other places throughout the Asia-Pacific region. What we're going to, we're, go, we're, leave, uh, we're leading to heavily impacted ecosystem, species habitats, cultural sites, and living indigenous and local communities, in a lot of cases, in, at the brink of extinction. I'm going to switch gears and talk about Russia and the area where I work and why this region is relevant to this panel and to this conversation. As I mentioned, I work for a San Francisco-based organization one of our priorities is building and sustaining a broad coalition of environmental and indigenous organizations in Siberia, Russian Far East, and the Arctic. Joint campaigning and direct financial support for these groups. We've worked in the region for more than 20 years, and we've helped to build one of the most effective movements that works to protect both local people and the environment. Our strongest belief is that local and indigenous communities are the best equipped to protect their own environment, and this is why we prioritize local needs and build relationships. Why Russia is relevant? In the, er the areas we work in, Siberia, Russian Far East, and the Arctic are home to some of the most profoundly beautiful and globally significant wilderness areas and large intact ecosystem left on planet Earth. Russia is home to one-fifth of the world's forests and endangered species such as Amur leopard, Siberian tiger, and Western Pacific gray whale. Lake Baikal, as I mentioned, is the world's oldest and deepest lake that has one-fifth of, of the world's fresh water. The Kamchatka Peninsula, for example, is home to the world's densest population of brown bears and boasts spawning rivers to one-fifth of the northern Pacific wild salmon. Secondly, why Russia is important is its relation to China in the Asia-Pacific overall. Natural resources in Russia are being exploited at an alarming rate for China and the rest of the world. This includes oil, gas, timber, minerals, and illegally harvested rare and endangered species. China's going out policy, also referred as the going global strategy, which is an effort initiated by the Chinese government to promote Chinese investments abroad, and their decision to clean up its act within the country is hurting communities all over the world and impacts are most felt in the Asia-Pacific region, including Russia, Mongolia, and countries of, of, of Southeast Asia. There are currently plans by the Russian government at the market demand of China to sacrifice several lar large free-flowing rivers to provide hydropower electricity to export for export to China. 
One of the largest Russian companies, Bazel, teamed up with Chinese energy company Yangtze, is, building, is planning to build 10 large hydro dams to generate energy to, for export to China. And I can guarantee you that not a single dollar will be given back to local communities that would be directly impacted by hydro dam development. I'm going to give a, a little snapshot about Russia. I'm sure, like, you know a lot about Russia. I just wanted to basically create that picture. So what's the political situation? As you know, two years ago, we had state Duma and presidential elections, and Putin was elected president for the for third term. The presidency term has been extended by a special degree from four to six years, which means that Putin is looking to stay in power for at least the next 12 years. Political power is getting more centralized. Current legislative and executive branches all consist of members of the ruling party, United Russia, that are doing anything, everything possible to mold legislature to their advantage. Soon after the elections, hundreds of thousands of people went out in the streets in Moscow to voice their discontent with the existing regime. And for a moment, everyone felt that things are going to be better. Fearing the uprise and the discontent from the public, Putin launched an unprecedented crackdown on civil society, and specifically NGOs and indigenous rights groups. Right now, eight of our partner organizations are facing charges and named as foreign agents, according to new concocted law that prosecutes NGOs that receive foreign funding and engage in broadly defined political activity. What's this economic situation? Unfortunately, the immense social, economic, and political, uh, uh, political upheaval Russia has experienced over the last two decades have put a tremendous strain on the environment, and specifically indigenous people who are always on the forefront and experiencing first-hand changes and impacts. Today, driven by the high prices for fossil fuel, fuels and other natural resources, Russian and international companies are exploiting the country's oil, gas, mineral, timber, and marine resources at an alarming rate. At the same time, in the past 20 years, Russia has experienced an unprecedented growth of capital, but most of the capital comes from resource extractive industries. There is no diversification of economy, which means Russia's economy is not stable, but dependent on oil and gas prices on the global market. There are currently 95 billionaires in Russia, almost all of whom are, have close ties to Putin and his close circles. In the legal field, unfortunately, in the recent years, environmental law in Russia has been dramatically changed to allow development. For example, law in special, specially protected areas has experienced changes that threaten to extinguish specially protected areas or lower their status of protection to allow development, including mining and large-scale tourism. Amendments to the Forestry Code extinguished the Federal Forestry Service, leaving 7,000 foresters without jobs and opening Russian forests to logging and forest fires. Abolishment of the institution of the state environmental law, uh, state environmental impact review that led for, to growth of large infrastructure projects throughout Russia. We and my, our partners always find ourselves working on the offense because the projects keep coming up. In 2009, we achieved a huge victory by preventing plans to construct a dam in Evinkia, which is an indigenous territory in central Siberia. Which would, this project would have displaced 7,000 indigenous Evinki people and flooded thousands of, hect thousands of hectares of valuable boreal forests, and we achieved that victory. We prevented that from happening. Two years later, <laughs> two years later, the, the Russian government backs up a plan to build 10 hydro dams for energy export to China. The fact that I already mentioned. mentioned. What's happening with the indigenous rights? Compared to many communities around the world, indigenous communities in Russia do not have land rights as exercised in the United States and Canada. All land belongs to the federal government and having government having government that has close ties to the extractive industry. We experience aggressive exploitation of natural resources, violation of human rights and rights of indigenous peoples to their resources. More than 10 years ago, Russian government adopted the law to create territories of traditional nature use for indigenous peoples, but not a single territory of traditional nature use has been created since that law was adopted. 
Instead, the open spaces that were supposed to be managed by indigenous communities for land, industrial, and tourism development. We currently have the list of more than 100 hotspots where in extractive industries are in direct conflict with needs and the rights of indigenous people. What are we standing up against globally? Unfortunately, we're standing up against the immense force, which is this global movement of international corporations, governments, large economies with their free trade agreements, large international and multilateral institutions. This global narrative is being advanced by G20, APEC, the World Bank, WTO, and others to promote infrastructure development and conversion of nature into, and culture into commodities in places of biological and cultural diversity. And as you know, most biological and cultural diversity is located in the lands of indigenous peoples. So what do we need to do? We need to build capacity of indigenous communities and help them assert their rights. We need to strengthen community leadership and technical know-how, create and disseminate education resources, and help communities to advance their human and indigenous rights. We need to connect different indigenous networks to one another, like from Russia, bring Russians here to the United States, bring, bring Arctic people to Honolulu. We need to tell the story, increase media attention, and expose the industry industry-driven gold rush. Most powerful stories come from people themselves, such as the one that I heard about walrus hunters in Nome a couple of years ago, who told me that they keep losing their husbands and sons to harsh hunting conditions that have worsened over the past decade of climate change. Or such as the story from Jeju Island, where the culture of women divers, abalone divers, is basically going to be extinct <coughs> due to the military base. I truly believe that people matter. We matter. Voices of the 90% of people matter. Sorry. <laughs> there have been numerous cases in the history of humanity when one person single-handedly changed the course of the history. I know, standing by, I know we are standing up against the immense force that 90% of, uh, of that force that has 90% of the global wealth. However, if we manage to ignite the flame from one person to another, we will be able to organize the global movement, which would be the counterforce to the existing economic superpowers. Thank you.